Hadassah is a girl in the wrong place at the wrong time, a Jewess in the city of Susa. She lives in exile, a stranger in a strange land. Her beauty is such that when the king decides to put away his first wife for refusing to display herself before a party of drunken men, Hadassah has the dubious fortune of being chosen as candidate to be the next queen. She's taken from her family and forced to hide her true identity, taking the Persian name of Esther. She is chosen as queen, but soon finds that she has a deadly enemy, an enemy the king has promoted to his right hand, an enemy on a mission to kill all of the Jews. And lucky Esther is the only Jew in the whole empire with enough power to have any chance at all of saving her people from destruction. It's a nasty situation to be in. You have to imagine that Esther is wishing she was just about anywhere else, or better yet, living in another time without this threat. Imagining her pain and fear makes you wonder why a loving God would allow a good person to suffer like this. Forget for a moment that we know how the story ends and try to imagine it. These days, we tend to picture Esther as such a kick-ass figure that we forget exactly what she went through to get there. Remember that she is a young woman, an orphan, a member of an oppressed and disliked race within the empire of the Medes and Persians, who has just experienced this insane meteoric rise from nobody to queen of the empire, but is still unsure of her power. Now she is suddenly being asked to save her entire race. To do so, she has to approach the king without an invitation and risk being executed. If she survives, she will have to reveal that she is Jewish and risk being condemned with the rest of her people. She is being asked to risk her own life to save others. I'm sure you've all experienced that feeling of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. You go to ask your boss for leave and find that she's just accepted someone else's resignation and is feeling really grumpy and stressed or a woman with a baby sits next to you on the train and fails to prevent the child from putting muddy footprints on your clothes, or you find, find out that the scholarship someone had just told you about, which is perfect for you, is only available for people a year younger than you. These wrong place at the wrong time experiences can be more sinister too. Like when you tragically happen to be one of the young people in an American school, when a shooter comes through randomly killing people. Esther must have felt a bit like one of these innocent victims. She has never, herself, done anything to Haman, and he doesn't even know that she's a Jew, yet he randomly decides that he wants to exterminate her people. And because of her position, it is suddenly her job to do something about it. What do you think were the questions running through her head? I imagine they were something like, why me? Why now? Do I really have to carry the responsibility of saving my entire people? And the guilty question, if I don't act, will this destruction really come to me? Or can I escape because I'm the queen and no one knows that I'm a Jew? Esther's situation of being in the wrong place at the wrong time in many ways echoes our own position as this generation facing the ecological crisis and the escalation of climate change. We ask why, out of all of the generations, it has to be us to face this crisis. We ask why the crisis had to become so critical now, in this particular generation, when we've known about climate change for the last 50 years and about the relationship between carbon dioxide and the atmosphere for even longer. We ask whether we really need to sacrifice our own comfort in order to reduce CO2 emissions and move towards a future where we burn less fo fossil fuels. Finally, as citizens of a rich country like Australia, we ask whether it might be possible for us to personally avoid the consequences of climate change, even if we don't act. In some ways, what we are being asked to do is even harder than the task set for Esther. Her challenge was to risk her life by entering the king's presence uninvited. But if he chose to hold out the golden scepter to her and she could convince him to save the Jews, 
then everything might be okay. We, on the other hand, are not being asked to risk, to risk execution, to fight climate change and the ecological crisis. We are being asked to give our lives though. We are being asked to change the way we live, to live simply so that others can simply live and to rethink our position in the created order. We are being asked to recycle, to use renewable energy sources, to protect, protect endangered species, to plant native gardens, to turn off lights and taps, and a host of other small changes in our lifestyles and behaviours that can make a world of difference. We are being asked to save ourselves by protecting the only planet we have. And as Christians, we are being asked to show our love for the Creator by caring for creation, living out the teachings of the Bible in relation to the earth, and being authentic in the way that we live. We are being asked, what we are being asked to do is both hard and easy. The only sure thing is that it is critical that we act, and soon. When Mordecai tells Esther to go to the king, she explains why she can't. It's against the law and points out that she's not in the highest favour with the king at the moment and he hasn't asked to see her in a month. But what she is really saying is, why me? This is a recurring theme throughout the Bible when God calls people to act. When God calls Moses from the burning bush, he replies, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God's reply, I will be with you and you will be given a sign when you have finished the task. Gee, thanks, God. And when the Lord calls Gideon, he replies, but sir, how can I deliver Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Again, God's response, I will be with you and you will succeed. Each time, God is asking for a leap of faith, asking, us for, us, asking for us to step out and act. Even if the proof that God is with us won't come until after we've done what we've been asked. There are a lot of people in our generation asking why me at the moment. Politicians who don't want to risk the economic cost of investing in more sustainable technologies and programs for mitigation and adaptation to climate change. Businesses who don't want to have to change their core business or the way they do things and people who don't want to have to give up their overseas vacations or petrol guzzling cars. People don't like changing and climate change is calling on them to change urgently. So some have even turned to denial of the science as an easier option. This allows people to answer the call with, well, I'm not going. Someone else can free Israel from slavery. Someone else can fight the Midianites. Someone else can do my share of the work reducing our collective environmental impact. Mordecai's response to Esther's question of why me is twofold. Firstly, the fact that you live in the palace is not going to save you from this threat. Likewise, the fact that we live in Australia, a rich country, is not ultimately going to save us from the effects of climate change. Our wealth will provide a buffer that poorer nations do not have but eventually we will be unable to avert our own suffering. We are all in this together. Secondly, Mordecai tells her that it is up to her because God has put her in this position for such a time as this. Everything that has happened to her has been leading up to this moment, this opportunity to serve God in this important way. Again, these moments are recurring themes in the Bible. The Garden of Gethsemane is one. Jesus pleads with God to take the cup of suffering from him, dreading the pain and suffering he's about to go through. But he finishes his prayer by asking that not his will, but God's be done. Jesus knows that as much as he would like to avoid what is about to come, it is for such a time as this that he has come. This is the moment for which he became incarnate on earth. This is the moment that will allow him to redeem all creation by his blood. And this is a necessary suffering before his resurrection and victory over death. Like Jesus, sometimes we wish we could avoid our for such a time as this moment. But if, like him, we go ahead in God's will and not our own, 
we can become the eternal victors. So how does Esther respond when she is asked to give her life for others? She says, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther says, yes, I will answer the call. Yes, I will give my life for my neighbours and my people. She goes to the king and she convinces him to save the people of Israel from Haman the Agagite. And from this moment on, Esther's courage and bravery is commemorated by the Jewish people in the festival of Purim. This series of negative events in her life has become the most beautiful opportunity and turning point for her. By being willing to lose her life, she has saved it and ensured that she will be remembered forever. For in this moment, Esther, the orphaned nobody, has just become the saviour of the Jewish race and ultimately the saviour of the whole world through a Jewish man from Nazareth. Our generation is faced with this same opportunity. In the words of Roger Payne, we should think of our present problems as being the most singular opportunity for greatness that has ever been offered to any generation in any civilization in all of human history. If we fail to receive that opportunity, to act on it, then my feeling is that we will become the most vilified generation that has ever lived in human history. However, if we act, we'll become the heroes of whom our descendants will boast until the end of all history. This is your chance to become a hero. This is your chance to go home, look up one of the hundreds of ecological footprint tools on the internet, work out how you are contributing to the, pro to the problem of climate change and commit to doing something about it. This is your opportunity to tell others to do the same and to lobby our government to have the courage to act further. If you are already doing these things, then great, that's fantastic. But what more can you do? There is always something. Don't let anything stand in your way. Don't accept any barrier. Show the creator how much you love him by pouring out your love on the earth and all its creatures. Nothing you do will be too small to make a difference in God's eyes. The Lord will see every light switch, every letter, every tree planted, and you will be rewarded for each and every one. The book of Esther presents us with a powerful message of hope. Even in the darkest days of our lives, when everything seems lost, when it seems like God has abandoned us to our fates, still the Lord is in control. He has plans for our good to give us a future and a hope. When we step out in faith, and suffer along with others, like Esther did, God rains blessings upon us beyond anything we could have hoped for or imagined. Esther embraced her moment, the for such a time as this, in her life. We are called to do the same. After all, Esther was never really in the wrong place at the wrong time. She was in God's place at God's time. Likewise, our generation is not faced with the seemingly insurmountable obstacle of climate change for nothing. We are not in the wrong place at the wrong time. God has called us to be here for such a time as this. God is challenging us to act and promising to be with us as we do so. How will you respond? <laughs>